gardening. Are you ready to talk about gardening? There's a lot to do. This is the January monthly checklist. Uh, so I have a lot of stuff to go over. So make sure you're grabbing like a pen and a paper because we're gonna talk about everything you can possibly have in your garden and what to do this month. Uh, I am Sarah Smith. I'm a horticulturalist here at Rogers Gardens. And thank you so much for tuning in and rolling out of bed and hopefully you got your coffee and you got your pen, your paper, and you're ready to go uh, talk about gardening because that's what we're gonna be doing. It's a pretty big list. Uh, I have a little cheat sheet back over here. So if you see me look off to the corner, that's just so I don't forget something because there's a lot to go over. It's, it's, we're so funny here in Southern California with the way that we garden. Uh, anywhere else, you're not gardening in January, but here you are. Uh, you probably took a little bit of a break between like Thanksgiving and Christmas. You kind of let things go. Uh, hopefully you did some fall planting. That is the best time to plant here in Southern California, get things established. They got that really amazing rain that we got. They're getting all settled in, the roots are growing, and in springtime, they're gonna go kablamo. So, uh, but this is a time to catch up on anything you forgot to do. And there's a lot of kind of maintenance-y stuff to do this month. So, uh, you know, get on your like galoshes so you're not getting all muddy. <laughs> get your pruners all nice and cleaned up. This is a good time to do that too. Uh, and get out there and start pruning and trimming and adjusting and, and making all those small tweaks. So when spring comes along, you're not behind the game. So that really happens a lot. People think, oh, I have to do all my gardening in spring. And here in Southern California, if you're gardening in spring, you're too late. <laughs> you're, too, you're playing catch up at that point. So uh, first things first, the thing I wanna talk about is annuals. This is a great time to do all the cool season annuals. So that's a big collection of what I've got here. This is a really fantastic time to get them in the ground. They're getting nice and settled. And in the springtime, they're gonna start flowering. You don't wanna plant it in the ground and they're trying to establish and flower. This is a time to get them in so that way they're grown in, they're settled, and then they can put all of their energy into uh, producing those beautiful flowers and being lush and full and healthy and really, really strong once we start warming up. So all the different things that I absolutely love, and I couldn't pull everything because there's just way too much to go over today. Uh, the anemones are just so, so pretty, so, so beautiful. Uh, anemones are super great. You can grow them from the little rhizome bulbs, uh, but we have starts, which is really fantastic. All the things like your violas and your pansies, I absolutely love violas. They're so pretty. They're such a perfect underplanting. All the poppies, we do a really great deal every month and it's a buy two, get one free. And we have the Italian poppies right now. Uh, they're a type of Icelandic poppies, but the flowers are huge on them. They're so beautiful. I've planted a few and some of them already started flowering for me. Um, things like your foxgloves and stuff like that as well. Annual plants need a lot of fertilizing. They want to be really, really fertile because they are kind of a one and done type plant. Uh, so they put their all their strength into flowering and then they're over. Uh, you want to give them all the fertilizer and all the nutrients they need to put out those really beautiful, really super showy blooms. So you want to use something like the rose and flower mix. This is a really great granular fertilizer. You just throw it on the ground. You don't need to mix it with water. Uh, there's ones you can mix with water that are nice as well. I'm a lazy gardener. If you've ever watched any of these, I tell everybody that all the time. I have so much garden that I don't want to spend a lot of time mixing and acting like a chemist in my yard. I just want to grab a handful of it and throw it on the ground and let the water work it in uh, as I'm watering. So this is a really, really great one for that. Um, you also want a deadhead. That's super, super important. And I know you, again, if you watch any of these with me or Suzanne, we talk about deadheading all the time. And deadheading is where you're going in because annual plants put all their energy into flowering and they're trying, the reason they're making the flowers is to produce seeds so they can continue to live on, right? So once they're done and they make those seeds, the plant dies, that's what an annual means. So it means it's kind of a one and done sort of plant. Um, annuals tend to be the most beautiful showy plants, but you wanna make sure that you cut off those flowers so the plant doesn't go, cool, made my seeds, my job is done. You want them to keep making more flowers. It also is just nice because it keeps it really tidy. Uh, I also love deadheading where I look at something and it's maybe just past its prime, but still looks beautiful. I'll still cut it, like especially this one, and I'll bring it in the house. Uh, and that way I have flowers and tiny little bud bases and stuff all over my house. Um, I love doing that. And like with this one, the ends of the, the little 
petals are looking just a little peaked, so I'd probably cut that one now. Uh, but you want to go through and take anything off that looks kind of bad. You can use your fingers, you can use pruners, uh, fingers for something small. Uh, that's why I never have nice nails. Uh, but you just pull those off uh, and you can use your fingers to just pinch those off uh, or just cut them off. So always have your pruners on and ready. Uh, he picks out the sweet peas for us every single year. Uh, they come in from England and we have them grown especially for us. Uh, so it's something you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, it is not too late to put your sweet pea seeds in, but almost. You need to go out right now and do it and then come back. Oh, wait. Okay. <laughs> so put your sweet pea seeds in the ground now. If you have seeds, don't wait any longer. Um, if you don't have seeds and you're like, oh, I didn't pick out any seeds. If you go look, the seeds are probably super picked over. We probably have, I know we don't have any more of the ones from England that we got in. Uh, there's not a lot, but we do have the starts. So if you waited too long, you can get sweet pea starts. So these are the starts. These are the ones that uh, we have grown specially for us that come from England. Uh, beautiful, beautiful colors. Uh, this is the mauve on white and, and chanty. There's um, the other one I picked that I really like too, uh, the crimson, uh, the millennial. So these are so, so pretty. Um, when you're growing sweet peas, you want sweet peas. You want to make sure that they get really ample sun. The more sun, the better. They need something to attach to. So they have to be on a trellis or something like that. Uh, a chain link fence. If you have an ugly chain link fence and you want to cover that up, sweet peas will do a really, really good job. Um, make sure you start tying your sweet peas right away. I pulled this because this is my favorite thing to tie sweet peas with. Uh, the little wire twist ties, I wind up, they're very delicate. I wind up breaking so many when I'm using those. This is um, like a jute string. I really, really love this. Uh, I love this little container. It can fit into some of my pockets for my bigger gardening pants. And you just pull it out. It has a little cut on there automatically. So you just pull it up and it cuts that piece right off. And it's just really nice because it's way gentle on the little tendrils. Uh, the sweet peas, some of them will be, it's funny. I, I look at some and some varieties I find grow upright really well. And some I really have to tie on all the time. But the more you keep them tied up and off the ground, uh, the flowers aren't going to get dirty. And keep those deadheaded. Keep your sweet peas deadheaded. And the whole reason to grow sweet peas is they smell good and they work really well inside the house. So keep those all deadheaded. More flowers. Same thing like the annuals. Uh, so get those sweet pea seeds in the ground ASAP. Um, and then grab some of this nice tie because this works really well. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is fruits. Uh, all of the fruit stuff is really, really great to plant now. So that's the things like your blueberries, your canes. Uh, that's going to be your cane berries, like your raspberries, boysenberries, things like that. Uh, we do really well with the boysenberry blackberries um, here in Southern California. Raspberries, there's some varieties that are made for the warmer weather. They're much more of a cooler weather thing. Uh, we do really, really good with blueberries. Blueberries are super easy in pots. Um, I grow tons of different blueberries. I'm a big blueberry fan. Um, I'm more of a strawberry fan. We'll get into that in a second. That's my all time favorite. It's like super passionate about strawberries. Um, but they need a little bit of a, uh, an acidic soil. So something like this works really well for blueberries in pots. So much easier in pots than in the ground, I find. Uh, that's my personal experience uh, and, you know, yards that I have maintained. I always find the ones in the pots are so much healthier and happier. I think partially it's because you can control the soil a little bit more by acidifying it. Um, we have great varieties from Monrovia. Uh, you do not need to have two different blueberries to get blueberry fruit. That's a common misconception. Um, the, you'll get more, for sure, if you have two different uh, plants, um, but maybe about 20% more per plant. One will do totally fine. I love the Bountiful Blues, Sunshine Blues are some of my favorite ones. Uh, and it's a fantastic time to plant strawberries. And the really cool thing that we have right now is there's strawberries in here. These are strawberry bare root. Uh, strawberry bare root's really, really cool. Uh, this is how they plant them in all the strawberry fields that you see here in Southern California. We do so good with strawberries and I'm an absolute strawberry fanatic. I have so many different kinds. Uh, they're really, really fun plants. Uh, every single pot that I have has a strawberry somewhere in it. <laughs> so they're really good in pots because they like to kind of hang over the edges. Uh, but these are strawberry bare roots. Look at that. 
that's one nice, beautiful strawberry plant right there. So just like planting bare root roses, you can plant bare root strawberries and these produce so fantastically. Uh, it's really a great way to get a lot of strawberries too because you need a lot of plants to have any kind of good harvest. Um, this one inside here, I'm trying to remember how many is in here now, 15 I believe, right? Yeah, 15 in each bag. Um, so this is a really great way to get a ton of plants, 15 plants for $6.99. That's a super fantastic deal. Uh, and we have seascapes, we have chandlers. Uh, there's, it's a really great way to get a lot of strawberries. They like really fertile soil too. Um, so I use the rose and flower mix on them. Um, to really get them going. So I have a really great video too. You can go again onto our YouTube page and see some of the videos. I have some strawberry videos and there's a ton of different strawberry videos, but I did one when we first started getting the bare roots in that explains how to plant them uh, and how to maintain them, uh, keeping the runners off and all that. So there's a lot to strawberries, but get the strawberries in the ground. Alpine strawberries too, one of my all time favorites. Alpine, Alpine strawberries are kind of like um, wild strawberries. So they're tiny, little tiny berries. They don't produce the runners. They're so cute and petite and adorable and just so springy. I just, they're adorable. I love them. They look really pretty. I use them in with my annual plants. So I love mixing uh, my Alpines in with you know, the little violas and stuff like that. It's just like so magical. I love alpines. So we have some alpines in right now. I particularly like the white alpine strawberries. Those are my favorites. Um, wildflowers. Wildflowers too right now. Um, you want to get those done now. You're almost a skosh too late for wildflowers. But what you'll have to do is if you want to plant wildflower seeds, um, you want to do this and you're going to probably have to water because we missed the really big good water. Um, even if you have seeds going right now, uh, you still want to water if we're having a dry day. Like you've been getting up in the morning, you've noticed it's really wet. Cool. You're not going to need to water. But if we have a couple days like this where I woke up this morning and it wasn't really wet outside, uh, if we have like two more days like this, I'm going to have to water my seeds. Um, you want to make sure you're weeding like crazy. So what's really important, um, some packages will show you what the starts of the seeds look like. So you know the difference between the seed sprouting and weed sprouting. Weeds will take over very, very quickly uh, wherever you are doing your wildflowers because you're giving them that extra nutrients and extra love and extra water. Uh, so know the difference between the two. Um, a really great trick, especially with the um, California poppies and the lupins is put your seeds in with sand, like coarse sand in a jar, shake it up really good and then put it out. That will help them germinate a whole lot better. Uh, so make sure that if you've got your seeds still, get those in the ground now because it's just getting a little bit too late. So do that, go plant your, your sweet peas, go plant these. Um, I'm gonna jump back to fruits real quick. Uh, one thing that I forgot to mention is if you have grapes, this is the time to prune back your grapes. Um, you don't wanna prune back your grapes when you start seeing new leaves on them. When you start pruning them, what'll happen is they'll start dripping like crazy. Uh, all the grapes right now are very dormant. All the water and stuff is not running through them. They're pushing all that water back down to the ground and they're staying really dormant and very still right now. So this is the time when you really wanna cut those back. So make sure you're cutting your grapes back now. Um, watch a video, there's two different ways to do it. There's the spur way, which is what you see in the wineries, which is a kind of complicated thing. So if you wanna get real into it, uh, watch a few videos because it is uh, definitely an art to doing the spur pruning. So that's when you have the two arms and then you have the little ones that pop up from the top. You need to make sure those are spaced very evenly. Cane pruning is much, much easier. Uh, I came prune. I don't uh, spur prune my grape, uh, but I came prune it just because it's a way easier, more natural kind of thing. I kind of like my my grape to be a little more wild looking um, once it starts growing anyways. Um, and then also when you have something like that and anything that you have that's dormant now, so say it's your, um, your peaches and your apples and things like that, it's a good time to look at it, take out all those crossing branches, all the old branches, but you want a copper spray. Copper spray is a dormant spray that we do, so that keeps anything that could still be living on the branch fungus-wise, it's gonna kill that off. So when it does put out its nice new, super tender, really delicate and very extra sensitive leaves, that the um, funguses and stuff are not transferring to that. You wanna do this with your roses as well. So anything that's dormant, a good copper spray, and you're just spraying the actual branches that are just left, the canes that are just left, uh, of any of your plants, you're spraying those down and you're really saturating them. So that way you don't have things overwintering 
onto your new stuff. So copper spray, super important. It's something you're only gonna do really once a year. You can copper spray, I shouldn't say that, you can copper spray your leaves and stuff as well. I find it's a little bit harsh sometimes, uh, but this is something you definitely should be doing right now. Copper spraying all of your dorma stuff. Roses, grapes, apples, peaches, all that stuff. Really good to copper spray. Um, the next thing that I wanna talk about is herbs and veggies. So, um, we're in that full winter mode. You can still plant all of your winter stuff that comes into the spring that's just so nice and pretty. Um, my winter garden is always so much prettier than my summer garden, which just turns into a giant monster at the end of summer. I know you know what I mean. If you grow anything, that's gonna be your tomatoes and, and all the zucchinis and they get just super crazy. But your winter veg uh, vegetables are gonna be all the nice pretty cruciferous stuff, the leafy stuff, things like your kales, uh, arugula is really great right now. You can still get this all on the ground. They don't take up a lot of space. You can definitely pack in more than you think that you should uh, compared to what you do in your summer garden. Uh, people tend to underplant their winter gardens and overplant their summer gardens. I notice that all the time. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of guilty of that as well. Um, broccoli as well. It's a great time to do a second round of any of your um, shallots or onions or garlics too. Uh, so we sell the starts on these. I love growing shallots. They're so easy. Uh, so this is a great time. So if you did some like in October, you can do another round of those right now as well. And all of your herbs. So there's a lot of cool season herbs that I think a lot of people don't realize they're cool season. Um, and the two that I want to talk about specifically that people I think assume that they're a summer thing. Uh, that's because if you plant them now, they're really great in the summertime, but then people plant them in the summertime and they're like, it bolts and it doesn't last long. Can you guess what I'm talking about? If you've done it, you know. Uh, cilantro and dill. Cilantro and dill, everybody thinks of as being a summertime thing, but really it's actually a winter and spring plant. So if you get these established in now, they're gonna be really nice and really healthy. They're not gonna bolt on you. You can let them kind of sit and do their thing and really get nice big. Um, but I think everybody just assumes because there's so many summery kind of recipes that call for dill and cilantro that it's a summer plant, but it's really not. So um, if you can get cilantro in a six pack, what a great deal. This is such a great deal. You get six individual plants. Um, I usually will do a six pack of starts and then I'll side dress with seeds and I'll do a couple of rounds of those. So I always have a little bit growing. So my cilantro in my garden is primo. It's so, so pretty. I have it planted behind some cabbages and it just purple cabbages and the green cilantro on the back. I love, I love my winter garden. It's just so pretty. My winter vegetable garden is gorgeous. Uh, so, and then also things like parsley, tarragon. Um, I, finally figured out that trick with tarragon. Um, it took me, I can't tell you how many tarragon plants I killed <laughs> because I kept planting and planting and planting it. Planting it was too hot. Uh, and then I finally realized, you know, this is probably more of a cool season thing. Looked it up, sure enough. I tend to think I know everything and I <laughs> don't look things up. But uh, yeah, so I got mine established in an area that's not full sun either. Uh, it gets a little bit of shading. It's got a little bit of protection and I planted two there and that was finally the right spot. I moved it around all over my garden and finally found the right spot. So I found in the full sun, it just fried. Um, and now that I have it nice and established, it does really great. It goes a little dormanty and I have to kind of cut it down when it gets too hot, uh, but it keeps coming back. Uh, for a while. It still is a tender perennial, so I don't think it's going to live there indefinitely, but I've had it for about three years already, so it's doing really well. And parsley, chives, all those kind of things. And we're so mild here. That's not to say that you can't plant uh, your things like your thyme and your rosemary. All those are totally good to do right now too, uh, because we are very mild, but this is a really good time to get those cool things in. Uh, so make sure you're doing that for sure. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is grasses, ornamental grasses. This is the time to cut back those ornamental grasses. Um, you don't want to cut them back too early. And it's really nice to kind of let those uh, flowers, the little feathery, pretty seedy things kind of go to seeds. The birds love them. Uh, they should look nice and kind of almost like beautiful tufts of hay at the moment. And it's really nice. I love 
we don't have a lot of seasons here in Southern California. So I like planting things that remind me that it is actually winter time. So uh, I love planting those in and I like keeping them in there kind of until the last minute when they're starting to look almost totally dead. Um, so those are going to be things like your uh, miscanthus, it's going to be your penicetum, uh, your mulbergia. Not everything is like this where it wants to be cut down, but you're basically going to grab the plant and cut it down just a couple of inches to the ground. So if you have ornamental grasses that are looking really kind of ratty and crazy, those are the ones that you can cut back to the ground. Uh, so make sure you know what it is that you have, however. You don't want to do that to like your blue uh, ficuses and stuff, or fescues. They don't... Um, they will be okay, but they don't want to be cut super hard like that all the way down to the ground. Uh, you just want a few inches uh, for the other big, taller grasses. Um, and then the other thing now is we're going to talk about like pruning things. This is a time to get out in your yard, really kind of observe, look at your plants, look at what did well, what did you like the shape of, what got way too unruly, so you can control that now. This is the time to start pruning all that kind of stuff now. So like with your grapes that you should be pruning at the moment, um, things like your butterfly bush, your budlea, uh, you can prune those hard, like 75% back. That's hard on a plant. Normally you want to go like 25, maybe 50%, uh, but the budleas can be cut back super, super hard. So if you've got that budlea and you got it and it was cute and it was like this big and you plant it in your yard and now it's as tall as your house, you can cut it back, cut it back hard. You probably didn't cut it back hard enough or you just planted it last year. So you can go ahead and give that a nice big cut. The more you cut that back, the bushier and fuller and prettier and less floppy it tends to be. So give that a nice big cut back. Um, your azaleas right now should be kind of done flowering. They're putting out some, but they're kind of wrapping down a little bit. Um, with the azaleas, you want to, right now it's a great time to plant them. Um, so it's a good time to get those in the ground, but you want to make sure that um, you're going to fertilize those to get the last bit of flowers out, not with your acid mix, but with something here that's high phosphorus. So that's something that's got your high middle uh, number in there. Um, it's with your camellias. Camellias right now are kind of, some are done flowering um, and some are kind of in the middle of the, the flower. They're kind of peaking at this moment. Do not fertilize those. Those you don't wanna fertilize. If they're flowering, don't fertilize them. You wanna start fertilizing them when they're done flowering. And that's what you wanna do, the acid mix. So if you have camellias, um, if you have azaleas, you should have both of these um, in your arsenal because you are going to switch back and forth. You'll go back to when you just start kind of seeing the bit of flush coming out on your azaleas on your green. You know flowers are not far behind. That's when you switch to this guy. So this gives them flowers. This gives them the acid. Do not uh, fertilize your camellias while they're flowering. Uh, for one, you're just wasting it, but they're totally dormant. But because they're dormant, which is funny because you think they're flowering, they're actually active, but they're not. Um, good time to plant those too. Uh, so pick out all the ones you want. You can actually see the flower instead of a picture of the flower so you know what it's going to look like. Uh, sometimes those pictures get faded or they were printed too bright. So the, the picture doesn't always totally match the flower of what you're going to get. Um, so this is a really good time to see in person, know what it's going to look like, know what that flower is. If it fits your color palette, uh, get those planted in the ground now because they're actually dormant at the moment, which is kind of an interesting thing. Um, the other thing uh, that has a little bit of extra special care is hydrangeas. Uh, there's a couple of different hydrangeas. There's the ever-blooming hydrangeas, and then there's the one-time hydrangea. Ever-blooming is a newer hydrangea. We didn't have a lot of those before. There's more and more and more, like Endless Summer, uh, and I think Blushing Bride is one of the ever-blooming. So they're a little bit different, but the, the typical big ones that everybody used to have um, they're really picky on when you prune them back. Uh, you do not want to prune them back now. It's, it's a bit too late to prune those guys back. Um, so what happens is, is with those ones, so if they, uh, the, the rule is, and I'm going to check my notes so I make sure I'm doing this right, uh, the spring blooms, you want to cut them back after they flower. So that's going to be those big guys. If you cut them back in the winter time, you're actually cutting the new growth that's going to get the flower on it, and then you're not going to have flowers. I can't tell you how many times I have people come up and say, my gardener cut back my hydrangea, or I cut back my hydrangea. Uh, it's got a lot of great growth on it. It's beautiful, but I didn't get any flowers. 
and that's because they cut it the wrong time of year. So you really need to know what type of hydrangea you have before you go cutting on it because you might be cutting off all that new growth that you're going to get the flowers on and you only have the old growth and the old growth is just putting out all the nice foliage but it's not going to give you any flowers. So it's really important to know. If you have flowers in through the summertime and they're going and going and going, then you can cut those guys back in the winter time. That's totally fine because they bloom on old and new uh, so it's, it's totally fine to cut those back, but be really careful and really understand what kind you have before you cut them because that's super important because what's the point of having a big leafy plant with no flowers? Uh, it's really kind of heartbreaking, I understand. Um, also a good time for bluing formula. So if you do your hydrangeas blue or you bought hydrangeas that are blue, they are not going to stay blue. You actually have to work pretty hard on keeping them blue. We have very basic soil, so our hydrangeas tend to go very... Um, pinky kind of colors. Uh, back east, you see all the blue ones. So it's so funny. Back east, they try to get pink and out here we try to get blue. We want what we can't have, right? <laughs> so a uh, bluing formula uh, is really fun and you don't have to commit to it. If you turn your hydrangea blue, it's not going to stay blue. So if you want to do something kind of fun and different this year and turn your hydrangea blue or purple, if it's a very deep pink, it'll go a very purple color. Uh, it's a great time to do it. What's really kind of fun too is if you do kind of a little part of it, you kind of have multiple colors on one plant, you can actually do that. So it's very much um, being that wacky uh, mad scientist in your garden and doing something really neat and different. So bluing formula is what you want to get started with ASAP uh, to get those blue. And you just want to follow the directions um, on the back and really follow them to a T if you want them solid, solid blue. Um, if you kind of want that myriad of colors, so they're like rainbow hydrangeas, uh, you can be a little loosey-goosey with it and get different colors on one plant, which is really fun. Um, and the last thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to open up to questions because I know I covered a ton of stuff, right? Uh, the last thing I want to talk about is roses. So if you have roses, you want your roses to look like this right now. It is time to cut them back. So you want to cut back your roses every single year. Uh, it's going to depend on what kind of rose you have. If it's a climbing rose, if it's a bush rose, if it's a cane rose, uh, there's different ways to cutting those back. You want to give them a nice big cut back. You want to strip the foliage off of them because again, especially here with all the mildew problems that we wind up having just because it's so humid, uh, here with the humidity and the, and the marine layer that we have, we do tend to battle a lot of powdery mildew. We tend to uh, battle a lot of rust problems. You want to completely strip those down and get out that good old copper spray and copper spray the branches. Uh, give that a nice big um, drenching essentially on there. You want to rake up any kind of leaves or any kind of branches that you have cut off so it's really nice and clean underneath. Um, and then it's a good time to do Epsom salts. Epsom salts, um, not table salt. It's very, very different. Epsom salt is a hundred percent different. So it is like the Epsom salt you use like in the bathtub, uh, making sure it's not dyed or has any kind of weird oils or anything in there. Uh, you want to put the Epsom salts down on there. It helps with the, like the vigor. Uh, a lot of people claim it helps with like the flower color being more vibrant. Um, I've always Epsom salted my grandma Epsom salted her roses and my grandfather. So I do it. <laughs> and, um, now I understand it's the magnesium in there, uh, that is making those really nice and really full and just really vigorous too. Uh, so it's time to cut those back and we have tons and tons of fantastic videos on how to cut back your roses. So make sure I have a little bee visitor. Uh, make sure you uh, go onto our YouTube page and you type in roses and you can see all kinds of beautiful, really in-depth videos on how to cut back your roses because it is definitely a science and an art. It's uh, gardening in general is that way. It's a little bit of science, a little bit of art in there. So you have to kind of know the finesse of it. Um, so those are all the things you should be doing. It's a lot, right? There's a lot of stuff to do uh, this month. So uh, make sure uh, you check out all those individual videos for specific things, how to plant your bare roots, all that kind of stuff, um, how to trim things, how to fertilize things, the difference in hydrangeas. We have all kinds of great videos there, so you can check that out. But I am open to questions because we're alive. So do we have, I'm sure, yeah, questions because Melissa have, jumped up right away. <laughs> we have a good handful of questions. Yeah. Our first one was, how do you protect from rodents? Um, someone had a major problem with them eating their plants last year. Yeah, so uh, if I had the foolproof answer, I'd be a millionaire and not here. <laughs> um, rodents are hard. Anything warmed bodied is difficult. 
Um, it, it's really honestly about physical barriers, um, moving things around. Um, I occasionally deal with problems with um, rats and mice. We had a house being built, and I didn't know that this was a thing, but we had a house being built next to us and it was driving all of the rodents and stuff all over the place and I just, my tomatoes were getting wiped out. So I had to bag things up. I had to um, put um, bird netting and things like that around the plants to keep them away. I have not found a spray uh, that I think works really well. I mean, people will sell the oil sprays and stuff like that and they have cayenne pepper in it and mint and stuff. But as soon as that gets wet, that all just gets washed down into the ground anyways. Um, traps, I know that's not a fun, exciting thing to do, but uh, putting out traps. Um, I don't recommend ever, ever putting the poison traps out because you got to think about it. If the, if the rat is eating the poison, it's not dying in the box. It's crawling away someplace else and dying. And then something else is eating it. And that's now a poison thing that your pet may be eating, uh, you know, birds uh, may be eating. So uh, you definitely, I would stay away from poisoning. Um, it's just, it's not a good thing to do. We often see like birds and stuff that have had issues because they've eaten poisoned rats. So, uh, and pets as well, you know, your dog might get it or whatever because it's laying in the middle. I, it's getting very more, but let's, <laughs> let's go on. But yeah, <laughs> there is not, um, there is not a, uh, physical barriers and traps. That's really kind of the only thing that works, unfortunately. So we also had someone wondering about how to deadhead lavenders and another question that's kind of on the same topic of cutting back salvias. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So two different ways that you're going to do that. So let's tackle the lavender first. Um, lavender deadheading can take a really long time because they're usually pretty prolific. So you can follow the stem down. You want to follow the stem down uh, I wish I had something as a good example, but you grab the head of the flower, you follow some down until there's foliage there um, when you're deadheading and you just cut right above that. Um, but you can give your lavender a good hard cut back this time of year as well. So there's two different things, deadheading and cutting back are different. Deadheading is just cleaning up, making it look nice and pretty. Um, sometimes when I'm deadheading, I'm doing minor tweaking to the plant as I'm going because I'm already there I might as well um, but cutting back your lavenders you're just going to give those a nice big shear you can take about 20% off um, it doesn't really look beautiful when you first do that they could tend to get a little woody uh, but then you'll get that nice new spring comeback um, when it comes to your salvias when you look at your salvia you're going to see what we call basal growth so you have your stems that come up out of the ground, the leaves have kind of fallen off, they've gotten small, they've gotten yellow, but you'll see as you follow that down, much to like how you are with this rose, if you look at this rose, you can see nice little tiny baby growth coming up there. So when you're cutting back your salvia, and I would almost wait just a skosh uh, for some of that new stuff to come. Oh, she's gonna bring me one, nice. Um, so this one has been cut pretty nicely, but, um, when you follow down, you'll see nice new growth down here. That's all the nice new baby growth. So you can cut down to that, but I would almost wait honestly, um, because we're going to just kind of start warming up now. And once we start warming up, you'll see some new stuff to the end of this month to do that. Uh, wait till you see more stuff because it just helps you understand how much growth you can get on that and what you need to cut back. And you can also control it a little bit more. The more basal growth you have up higher, so the new baby growth on the old growth, you can kind of determine, well, I actually want this to stay nice and big, so I'm gonna cut to that first bit of basal growth. Or it was way too big last year, I wanna cut it down to the lowest basal growth. So uh, that's where I'm talking about the art and science. So the science is you're cutting above that piece. The art of is where do I want this to grow? Um, and how do I want this to grow? You can really control the plant's growth habit by where you're cutting it. So especially with roses, this is a great example. You look at the growth that's coming out and you want something that's growing this way, or maybe it's up against the house and you don't want anything growing against the house, you want it all growing this way. You cut to the little new growth pieces that are coming out on that stem that are pointing out in the directions you want it to grow, you cut above that to force that bit now because it's putting all its energy to the end of that branch that you have cut to grow out. So that's how you can kind of control and that's the science behind pruning uh, and the art uh, behind pruning is picking how you want to grow and where you want to grow. Um, the other thing I did not bring up talking about cutting back is don't hedge stuff. This is not the time for hedging. So if you have 
boxwoods and um, things like that that you're just hedging to make it into a nice shape, don't do that now because it's going to take a really long time for the new growth to come up and you're going to look at those blunt cut ends of things. So if you have like a ligustrum hedge or a boxwood hedge or anything like that, wait, wait till springtime to start hedging it because you want the new growth to come out to kind of hide those cut leaves and those blunt cut leaves. So don't hedge things with like shears, and like, you know, the electric hedgers at this moment, just let that stuff go. How about um, the best flowers for hanging pots in the winter time? Okay, yeah. So there's a lot of really beautiful stuff right now. It depends on if you're dealing with shade or if you're dealing with sun. Um, we have some gorgeous, really beautiful done videos. Onita has done some really pretty ones for um, doing the hanging baskets and stuff. Uh, depends if you're doing summer or shade. Um, when it comes to a hanging basket, uh, the old Rogers uh, way of doing the formula is the thriller, the filler, and the spiller. So you want something that's really exciting and big and bold. Uh, you want something that's going to spill over the edges, and you want something that's going to fill in and be the kind of in between the spill and the thrill. So your thrill is the highest, the spill is the lowest, something in that middle ground. Uh, that is the combination to any kind of beautiful plant uh, or, or planted pot, uh, something that's like an arrangement. So arranging a, a basket, you want to make sure that you're sticking with sun stuff versus uh, stuff that needs to be in the shade so everything is very, very happy. Uh, you can use any of these. I think um, pansies and violas make a super great filler because they're very showy, but they're lower and shorter. Um, even like this, this and some like pretty mule and bergia to spill over the sides uh, would be really nice or scaviola uh, to come over to the sides. Um, you want to make sure you have those three things. But uh, if you're doing annual pots, tons of great annuals right now. Uh, you can get really nice salvias planted in the ground right now too, scabiosa. Uh, you want to stick away from something like foxglove. This gets gargantuan. I love, and I didn't even touch on these, uh, ornamental kales. Uh, ornamental kale is so pretty. They get really, really neat and big and full. Uh, they just add a really kind of neat, this would definitely be a filler plant. Uh, they add a really kind of neat dimension. So it's nice when you have the really fine, delicate stuff to add that kind of bold, really like strong statement to it too. You don't want to do all fine textures and it's just too busy. Uh, you don't want to do all big, fat, bold kind of textures either. Again, it becomes very boring. So you want to mix the two kind of together to give all that dimension and stuff. But there's tons of the poppies, Iceland. I should have grabbed some of those, those Italian poppies. Uh, we're doing the buy two, get one free. They're super pretty, great in baskets because they've got that really tall, beautiful flower on them as well. So there's all kinds of great stuff right now. Um, we have um, all the, um, can't think of the name of it all of a sudden. The primrose, <laughs> all the primrose too for shade. Uh, primrose makes a great filler as well because it's low, uh, but the flowers are super, super pretty. I, I love the Conica ones. It's got the big kind of round leaf to it. Uh, there's ones that have kind of almost the romaine lettuce looking leaves, but they're really bright, bold colors. Uh, it's Primrose are a great one for that as well. And same thing in pots too. Is it too late to plant tulip bulbs that have been in the fridge? Well, okay, so I was gonna bring that up and I didn't, but I'm glad that you actually did. So uh, put them in the ground right now. It might be a smidge uh, too late. Uh, hopefully they've been in there long enough, but not too long. Um, you gotta get those into the ground now um, if you have anything left over. If you're finding tulip bulbs and crocus bulbs, uh, a daffodils, honestly, even at a sale price, I wouldn't bother with those ones. Any of the ones that need the cold weather, like daffodils here don't necessarily need the cold water. We get cold enough for most of the varieties that we grow around here. You don't have to refrigerate them. You can, uh, if you bought them earlier. Um, same thing with crocuses and tulips, but they're not something that repeat blooms for us because we don't get the cold. Maybe if you live in Big Bear, sure, <laughs> and you're watching from Big Bear, hi, <laughs> uh, totally you can do it, uh, but we don't get the cold weather here uh, in this little bit of Orange County. Um, so I wouldn't bother with buying those because you're not going to have enough time to refrigerate them to go. If you found them pre-chilled, 
totally that's awesome if you found pre-chilled bulbs go ahead and do it uh but if they haven't been i wouldn't put those in the ground now if you're seeing things like amaryllis and stuff like that still left over uh paper whites and stuff you can totally plant those those are completely fine but if you have something refrigerated plant it now absolutely now don't wait till tomorrow do it today <laughs> please <laughs> so then that way you get to get something out of it for sure how far down um, do you prune your rose bushes? And this viewer likes her roses, especially when they grow very tall. Okay, yeah. So it, it again, it depends. Again, it's that very much art and science. And I know uh, Laura Weaver did like a couple of multiple parts to how to prune your roses. So I think it's like three parts, maybe even. Um, and she really goes into depth on how to do it. So what you're doing is you're looking for the canes. Uh, you want to make sure you don't have a lot of crisscrossing with any kind of rose, whether it's up against a wall or a trellis or something or just the bush uh, you want it to be very open you want a lot of circulation through those roses uh, much like tomatoes because the humidity and stuff causes a lot of um, powdery mildew problems and stuff uh, which is really really rampant with roses around here because of the marine layer that we have um, so you want to make sure that it's very open so if you have something that's freestanding you want the whole thing to be very open and like a cage you don't want anything coming out the middle so think like a bird cage almost or think like i'm going to put a basketball or something right in the middle of this you want to make sure that's very open you want your canes very evenly kind of distributed so you don't want them all pointing to one side or all fanned out when it's a bush type if it's growing on a wall totally that's fine um, so you're checking those canes. So you're even going to cut away some canes. You'll see some canes. You might even see some sucker growth. Uh, sucker growth are those really long, crazy ones that come up right near the ground. Uh, that's a sucker from the uh, root ball. Uh, so you want to make sure you cut those all the way down. Uh, so you're cutting back to the canes. So the way I like to do it is I like to cut back to the canes that I want to keep. I strip those down. And then I'm looking at where the little points of the buds are going to come out. And you can see them on there this has stuff already growing but even if it doesn't have growing it's almost like a little eyeball on the actual stem and that's where a bud and a, a bit of lateral growth is going to come out from there not a flower bud but all the, the branching leaves and stuff there and you want to cut above that uh, so if you want it to be tall and you like the height of it there uh, you don't have to do a lot of crazy cutting uh, just cut back and get any mixed canes out and stuff strip it the best you can certain things like um, iceberg roses and stuff you strip a little bit but you don't have to strip all of it off the icebergs are so big and bushy um, so it just kind of depends on the type of rose and definitely go check out some of those videos Laura did such a fantastic job explaining how to do it she's very passionate about roses uh, and she really breaks it down so you understand how to do it um, so check some of those out too but first thing first get out all the old stuff get all the weird sucker stuff out so you can kind of and I, I'm often like cutting a little bit and stepping back and looking and going okay I want to take out that cane and that cane but I, I take out the dead stuff I take out the the really crooked or broken stuff I take out all the can all the suckers off first then I step back and look and then I take out the canes that I don't want to keep and then I do that step back and look and kind of cut it down to the height and then strip and then check it again uh it, it takes me a bit to cut my roses but thankfully we only have to do it once a year <laughs> so uh but it's just it's so nice and rewarding when you do it too because it's kind of nice to get rid of all that wild craggly stuff that we've been looking at for a while I haven't cut my roses back yet that's my weekend project today uh, so I'm really excited to do it because I'm just tired of how unruly it looks at the moment um, there's a viewer that has old blooms on her hydrangea right now mm -hmm. should she cut them and wear yes yeah, so if you have old blooms then you probably have um, an ever blooming type uh, so you can cut those now. That's totally fine if the blooms are still on there. If they're completely dried out and like you didn't have any in the summertime and you just had them all spring, which I doubt that's the case. Um, but what I would do is if you remember the name of what it is that you have, look it up. Look it up and see. Was it uh, an ever blooming one? If it's an ever blooming one, you can cut them back now. Um, if there's still like kind of scraggly blooms with like a little bit of color, you definitely have an ever blooming one and that's totally fine to cut back now. Um, when in doubt, cut them back after they're flowering. So that's just a good rule of thumb because when in doubt, if it's still flowering, 
and it flowered well into the summer and the fall, uh, then you definitely had an ever blooming one, uh, but still cut them back when they're done flowering. And then by the winter time, get them totally done. And we are officially in winter now. So, uh, you can give those a cut back now, but look at, again, look it up. I hate to tell you to do something that's wrong. Cause I don't, I haven't seen a picture of it. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just a dried flower, uh, that's still on there, but probably an ever blooming. Right. And then we had a great question. Um, Someone was just wondering how to get her dirt and soil to accept the plants that she puts in the ground. They seem to die after about a month. Um, yeah, so this, and it, really you should start this in the fall, um, but it's still a fantastic time to do it. You wanna amend, 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 amend. I have spent so much money on my soil. Um, and I think, I don't know, I feel like there's this new kind of surge where people are really understanding how important that is. And I feel like, uh, that was something that people didn't want to spend money. I want to spend the money on my plants. I don't want to spend the money on fertilizer and soil and, and compost and bark. It's not something that's fancy and exciting and you don't see it. It's, it's kind of hard, but it's just like doing a house. You got to spend the money on the important structure of it. Uh, that way you have a beautiful structure that you can put all the fun carpet and, and couches and things into. It's the same thing with a garden. So you wanna make sure that your soil is really, really rich and really, really healthy. Um, I love the Malibu compost. I put down Malibu compost in my yard every single year. Um, when I first am preparing a bed, if I'm like completely pulling everything out, I'm always gonna put a lot more in. Right now I just kind of side dress and top dress in areas where I have existing plants and where I'm planting a new plant. As I'm digging the hole, I dig the hole a little bit bigger than the plant, wider, not necessarily deeper. Then I backfill 50-50 with the old soil uh, and new nice rich compost and I mix that in. Um, using worm castings is really fantastic. Worm castings are a really great thing. They almost work like a natural systemic too in the ground. So worm castings is just a fancy word for worm poop <laughs> and it looks just like soil. Does it smell bad? It's not gross, I promise. Uh, putting that into the ground too uh, adds an enzyme into the plants that makes them really resilient against um, all the sucking insects and things like that. Your um, aphids and white fly and all that kind of thing. Super great if you have um, hibiscus. Hibiscus notoriously get a lot of white fly problems. So uh, putting that around, um, making sure that you're fertilizing too. You don't do a lot of fertilizing with your perennial stuff during the cold uh, time of year because the soil is kind of locked up and a lot of the nitrogen can't get pulled up, but the things like the phosphorus can, and that's that middle number on anything here. Um, so for your annuals and things, this is great, but I wouldn't bother too much with adding too much fertilizer into the ground now for any of your perennial stuff that's already existing. Uh, I would wait until February, end of February, depends on how warm or cold we are uh, in February. But, um, and mulching, mulching's huge. Mulching is really, really fantastic. And again, I think that's something we don't do enough here. Um, you know, I drive around the neighborhoods and stuff and I don't see very many people mulching, but mulching is great because it's keeping the soil uh, warm when it's cold and cold when it's hot. Uh, it's keeping all the moisture in the ground. It is breaking down and adding organic material into the garden and it's suppressing weeds. It's just such an amazing thing and it looks nice. It's just so nice to look instead of at the soil and the tiny little weeds and stuff that are coming up, just a nice thin layer of mulch is just really a great thing. Uh, and it promotes all the good living microorganisms that we have in the ground, the earthworms and the mycorrhizae, which is a beneficial fungi that attaches to the roots. So your soil is huge. Think about your soil like your gut health or like the bones of your house and that kind of thing. It's super important and makes everything else thrive. So um, good, rich, fertile soil. I've spent so much money on my soil, but my plants show it. It's just so nice. I don't have to do as much amending as I used to because I've really gotten it good and I've mixed it in. So super big. Amend, 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 fertilize, mulch. Uh, your plants will definitely be happy. We do have some um, more specific questions. We'll be sure to answer those in the comments later, but yeah. that covers all of our general garden Absolutely, questions. yeah. And then if you stumbled into this a little bit late uh, and you go back and you watch from the beginning and you think, oh, I forgot to ask that herb question or I forgot to ask that annual question, you can stick them down below because we will come back and check those out later uh, and answer those for you. And then go to our YouTube page. There's so much amazing content there. Uh, this was a very general overview of all of this stuff, but we break it down to specifics 
there. There's all kinds of really great things there. Uh, we're back to live streaming all of our garden content. Uh, so it's been a while since I've seen you guys. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're going to be doing every Tuesdays and Thursdays. We're going to be talking about uh, the plant of the week. Uh, we'll be talking about general gardening tips and stuff as well. Uh, so there's all kinds of fun stuff coming up there. Uh, it's really fun to do this general touch on everything. Reminds me of what I still need to do in my garden that I haven't done yet. Um, so it's really, really fun. So make sure you check out the YouTube page. Subscribe there because there are things that are not just live streams that come up on there uh, that are really nicely filmed and edited and so pretty. I'm always so impressed when I see this. I'm like, gosh, that looks great. Um, but it's so beautiful here. How can it not? Uh, so make sure you go and subscribe there. And then um, if you're not following us on YouTube or Instagram, make sure you do that and sign up for our newsletter. Our newsletter is amazing. There is so much great stuff. There is a hand written, written checklist for uh, this month that you can read there in depth. It covers most of the things I talked about here and additional stuff I didn't even get a chance to touch on. Um, and then all the great things we have going on here, like our flea markets and our, uh, you know, our spring program, which is going to be coming up and all the different things we have in the garden, the new stuff that comes in, rose varieties. It's just, it's a huge bit of wealth there. Uh, and great. So make sure you go and subscribe to that as well. So if you have any friends that are getting into gardening, make sure you tag them down below uh, so they can check it out. Or you know someone who's like, I don't know what to do. And you guys are talking about it. Check it out. Watch it with them. Uh, get all kinds of fun tips there as well for your friends. And um, be well, be safe, and happy gardening, everybody. Bye.